Hello and welcome to the Bold Leadership Story Show. Today we're live on Facebook and YouTube, and this is the show where we talk about experiences shaping exceptional lives. And today I have Mr. Tom Wildmans with me, and we're going to talk about Tom's uh, leadership stories. And I'll give you a little intro with Tom. He lives he lives now in where Ohio, Ohio, since uh, just north of Cincinnati, north of Cincinnati, with your wife. And then Luna the Wonder Dog. <laughs> Luna the Wonder Dog, who's the one who's really in charge. <laughs> right? What kind of dog is Luna? Luna is an everything dog. We got her as a rescue. She's Perfect. got some, I think she's got some Stafford Terrier in her. She's got some Lab. She's got some German Shepherd, probably some Coonhound. It's just a little bit of everything. She, she constantly amazes us with a Heinz 57 dogs. You yeah. have two daughters. One's in, wow, Berlin, Germany. Yep. She, she went over to visit Berlin about two and a half years ago with the intention of scoping it out and okay. never came home. Yeah, never came home. Oh, uh, I, I bet she's having a blast. She is. She really enjoys it. Good for her. What, what is she doing there? Is she going to school or is she working? No, she's a, um, she's a therapist. So okay. she, uh, she does. Ther Berlin's a really interesting country or city. You know, it's very international. Everybody mm -hmm. speaks English there. So it's mm -hmm. very easy to get along even if you don't know a lot of German. In fact, she's having it. It's hard for her to learn German because everybody wants to speak English. Right. Um, yeah, they want so to she does, she does therapy there. Well, and then my good. youngest daughter is, uh, is studying to be a pilot. Ah, excellent. Excellent. What, where is she at in her training? I did some of that when I was a kid. She's just at the very beginning. She's a freshman at, at Western Michigan University. They've got an aviation program. So she's uh -huh. just finishing that up. Um, she'll start flying this summer. Good for her. So, yeah, it's oh, amazing. It's amazing that's to think of somebody, you know, that I knew since she was a baby now wanting to fly airplanes and fly passengers. Yeah, flying the big dog airplanes. Yep. I just keep saying she's a really good driver, so she'll be a good pilot. Yeah, that, that's a good sign. Very good. And then you grew up in Southern California. I did. Yeah. I grew up in a, in a town called Thousand Oaks way back in the uh, the 60s and 70s. Okay. And um, so I think that that's has, north of Los Angeles a bit, right? Yeah, halfway between LA and, and Santa Barbara. Okay. And we moved there. Now it's a very, very big kind of city. I mean, it's got you know, several big corporations there. Amgen is there. It's a big biotech hub. When we moved there, it was 27,000 people. And you'd have to stop for traffic when they were moving the sheep across the main drag. Oh, very cool. Yeah, to, I, I'm in a little town south of LA called Temecula. And we had at one point, when we moved here, there was a duck pond down in the middle at the big intersection in town. And um, they had duck a duck crosswalk because <laughs> there was two ponds and the, the ducks would have their babies, you know, and these little, and they go back and forth, yep. go back and forth across the road. Yeah. So that's cool. That was fun. Back in the day when there, you know, it wasn't so, so it wasn't so crowded. Yeah. Now it's a little bit, now it's a little different. Now it's a <laughs> just a little, yeah. Still, it's still got that, kind of hometown country feel, but it's definitely that's what I hear about Temecula. It sounds like a really nice place. I'd like to visit sometime. Yeah. Yeah, you should. If, especially if you like wine, there's tons of wineries. We've got 43 I last I heard that. wineries now. And then we've got a uh, horse equestrian, lots of jumping and uh, quarter horse and thoroughbred breeding and boarding and training and then golf, lots of golf. And one of my favorites too is single malt. Do you do you imbibe at all? Oh, uh, single malt, just a little bit. Yeah, probably a little bit too much. <laughs> There's that little grin. Well, they've uh -huh. got distilleries in Temecula. Yeah, we do. We've got three now. Very cool. That's yeah. very cool. There's there's some really. They're just getting started, so they don't really have any anything that's aged yet. But um, it's it's a really fun trend. I love that. And then, and then we've got the microbreweries too going on. Mm -hmm. well, we've got, you know, we're, you know, I'm just a little bit north of the whole bourbon trail in Kentucky. And oh, so, really? Obviously a now lot we're talking. A lot of distilling in Kentucky. Yes. Uh, I'd love to get a distillery as a client and they can pay me in 
in in barrels. <laughs> now, there we go. That's fun. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like that's one thing I want to do. That's on the bucket list is to go on a, a distillery tour here in the US of bourbon and whiskey and Yeah, that's uh, really nice. Yeah. I love this. I've been trying the different single malts from Ireland and Scotland and the different Isle, you know, Isle and all those places over there. Mm -hmm. But there's some great stuff here too, I think. I think the whole, you know, it's interesting, the whole microbrewery micro coffee roasting. I mean, people are beginning to get a whole different view of what's possible with, with beverages. And yeah. I think, you know, the, the, the single malt, the, you know, the custom, not the custom, but the craft distillery movement now it's, mm -hmm. it's I mean, it's really, and it's, it's an exciting space to watch. Right. It is. And you're a manufacturing guy. Right? I am. I am. So you're, you're really, you're savvy the process. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's yeah, me too. You know, I, it's, I, it's a beautiful process because it starts with something that is not consistent. Right. And so like when I was in the coffee business, coffee, first of all, there are a whole bunch of different classes of coffee beans. They come from all over the world. Right. And mm -hmm. most, most places will blend them together to get a unique blend. Right. And, but depending on how much rain they got, how much sun they got, every batch tastes a little bit different. So you've got to have people that have a real sensitive sense of taste, a sense of smell to be able to make those adjustments. And it's the same thing with beer. It's the same thing with, with whiskey, right? If you, especially if you're going to blend whiskey, you've got to have real talent to be able to, the manufacturing is really straightforward. It's putting everything together to get that signature taste that you want to get. That's yeah. really, really fascinating about any industry that relies on kind of an agricultural product. Yeah. Cause agriculture's, there's a lot of variability in there, right? Exactly. Exactly. And so, and depending, you know, you want to, you want to even that out. I mean, it's interesting. I think in, in the U S we focus a lot on like single, you know, I mean, they do in Scotland too for single malt, but you know, just like one batch through the distillery with coffee, we're obsessed with things like, you know, Colombian or, or Costa Rican in wines, it's always a varietal. You know, if you go, I mean, I'm sure in Temecula it is too, but I know when I lived in Northern California, the wine in in Napa, you know, it would be a Cabernet or it would be a Zinfandel. In Europe, it's a lot different. They blend, they blend all these things together to get the signature taste of the winery or the distillery. I don't know what they do with coffee. Um, be something to, to go research. I'll have to go to Europe and research that and get back. Yeah, yeah go visit your daughter in, in Berlin. Exactly. Yeah, can I get on that? Can I get on board that trip? That, that would be yep. fun. We, all I want to do is go to different coffee places. Yeah, oh, I love I love doing that stuff. I One of my it's favorite really parts about traveling is is trying those things in different regions and and meeting the people that are there and getting this, these the stories. I exactly. love stories. Mm -hmm. So and everybody's got them if you just ask. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's so much fun um, to experience those things, and you don't do you don't get that unless you go there. You know, we can do these Zoom calls, but to actually get the the full experience, you've got to yes. got to be there, right? Zoom beats the heck out of a phone, but yeah. it's still two dimensional, right? You need to be there. You need to smell the air you need to touch the soil you need i mean you just need to be present and you can't really it's more difficult to be present on on a zoom thing you just don't you just miss a lot it, yeah when do. i did when i used to work in the pharmaceutical industry we had partnerships in europe and i'd make a point you know every every month or six weeks go visit my colleagues because it was a completely different experience to be sitting in the same room with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, they get, you get them to relax a little bit and they'll share some things that they probably wouldn't. And, and you just exactly. get a, a real, a much better feel. And, you know, business is all about relationships, right? At the end of the day, it is, we can, we can pretend it's not, but, and some people do, but it is at the end of the day, it's about relationships. It's about alignment relationships and having those relationships aligned to, 
something greater than any one person. Yeah, exactly. So you're you're now in the consulting world, correct? Yes. Yeah. How did what was it that brought you into that? And you you've got a manufacturing background we learned and you've got mm -hmm. some um you've got uh, experience traveling different places. Yeah, uh consulting I think was a natural outgrowth of two things. One was just developing the experiences that I had when I was in manufacturing, when I was um, you know, running some service industries. For a while, I took a time out from corporate America and went and um, purchased a, a I, I ran for about three years. I bought, developed, and then eventually sold a um, multi-unit franchise. Okay. So Which you know, one? did a lot of um, elements massage. Okay. So, you know, it makes complete sense, doesn't it, for a chemical engineer to go run a massage business. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What are you nuts? What? Yeah, exactly, Why did you do that? Exactly. The, the benefits were flow. great. The benefits were great. Um, yeah, okay. But um, looking back, I think it, what I've always really wanted to do is teach. And what I find is consulting is the next best thing, because in some sense, you know, especially as a strategic business coach or as a, as a fractional COO, you know, a lot of the, a lot of what you're doing is really teaching, you're imparting skills, you're imparting experiences. And I get a lot of satisfaction um, and fulfillment out of, you know, seeing somebody's eyes light up or see a team achieve something that they've not achieved before. Mm. Um, you know, or so, sometimes something they didn't even think they could. Um, and so consulting is a great way to, for me to both get that fulfillment, get that satisfaction and give something back because of, you know, I'm really standing on the shoulders of, you know, I was talking with somebody the other day, you know, it's like scarily enough, like 34, 35 years worth of operations, excellence experience. So, um, that's what got me into consulting and I really enjoy it. So who is, who do you like to work with? I like to work with small to medium sized companies that are really, they're looking to grow, right? They, they're, they're looking to get better than they are today. Mm -hmm. um, because there's some, there's, I mean, there's some owners, some companies, and it's, you know, more power to them that are what I call kind of lifestyle, right? It's like, everything's fine. We're fine. If we don't grow, it's flat. It's producing an income for me and I'm happy. Great. Yeah, they're not looking for a, um, an exit or but they're not looking for an exit. Right. So I'm looking for companies they're, they're just happy, you know, in the in the five to 200 million revenue range that are looking to grow that perhaps have um, hit a rough patch. Right. Things aren't as easy as they used to be. And they're not sure why things that they mm -hmm. used they used to work in the company aren't working anymore. And so the opportunity to dig into and understand, separate the wheat from the chaff, um, bring world-class characteristics or principles to the company, um, kind of clear out the chaff and, and give them a, a much clearer path so they can see the outcome that they want to get to in, in two or three years and how they're going to measure getting to those outcomes is is what I really enjoy doing. And then if need be, I mean, rolling up my sleeves and, and doing the work beside them, that's, that can be really, really fulfilling as well. But that's, those, that that's kind of where I look for. I, it's as far as kind of an industry niche, I think that what I do, what I like to do is so fundamental to business. I mean, I've had success in manufacturing. I've had success in the service, service industries. It's so fundamental that it applies to any country, any company that wants to strive for having world-class operational processes right so what are your what are your leverage points typically when you go in do you, you look at the the financial picture and do you look at the operations and supply chain and um quality and you know, all the different aspects do you get into the whole business or customer service sales and marketing do you, when you're looking at these companies to be able to grow their revenue it, it could be all of those it could be all of those the, the key is going in and first of all, establishing with the leadership of the company, 
what are they really trying to accomplish, right? What are the outcomes that they're looking for in two to three years? Because that then informs everything else, right? Because mm-hmm. what you want, what you want to do is look at here are the outcomes. Okay, well, where? And then the second is where are we? And what I find is a lot of times the companies don't have an outcome. They're just going month to month doing stuff, mm-hmm. right? Kind of hoping they're going to get better, right? And as they're going through, they're not necessarily measuring what those those key those key things that are important for them to reach that outcome so we want to go in we want to make sure that we've got a clear understandable outcome and that's got to be quantitative it can't be well we want to get bigger it's like well what do you want to do i want to i want to double my business okay i can i can i can we can work with that mm-hmm. right then well what, what does that mean let's take a look then at your revenue let's take a look at what your profit is, how much of your, um, you know, what's the difference between the revenue and, and, you know, your, your net earnings, what are you spending your money on and why are you spending it there? How much scrap do you, if it's a manufacturing company or a company that produces something, right? How much scrap are you producing? Right. Um, These are like privately held companies, right? Typically. Yes. Yeah. Typically privately held. So they've, um, been, they've got a founder or somebody who may have purchased the company and that owns it. Yes. And then, then, so are you, who are you working with? Are you working with the owners or? Typically I, what I want to do is I want to work. I, ideally I work with the owners or the CEO and sometimes those are the same person. Right. Right. But it's important when we go in and we do the work that I'm doing that we're working with the decision makers. So mm-hmm. it's, it's much more difficult to work with the division of a bigger company, for example, right? And say, go in and work with the hair care division of a Procter and Gamble. That's just, right. there's, there's too many restrictions on the ability to make decisions. There's too many other stakeholders. I want to work, and it's important to work with, you know, the key decision maker, the key stakeholders in the business. Yeah, so you can get something done, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Because, you know, so much of what we can do can go really, really quickly if you don't have the yeah. drag of extra approvals and stuff like oh, that. Right. And a lot of times speed is important. Yeah. What, do you find when you're working at that level, do you run into situations where the solution isn't necessarily the operation? It's the attitude of the owner? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, how that's do you, how that do you manage that? that? Well, so a, a great way of is one of the things that we, we tend to, in the West, we tend to bifurcate things, right? It's so it's like, I'm the owner and I've got a company. Yeah. Right. The, well, and, and I want to have work-life balance, right? Well, there's no such thing as work-life balance and there's no such thing as separating out the owner's interests and the business interests. It's really, we talk about work-life integration when I work with a, with a company. So part of what I do is get real clear with the owner on what they want to accomplish in the next three years. And then let's build the business around that and the business outcomes around that. So, you know, as long as the owner, and I, I've run into this, the you know, owner is, I want to change, but I don't want to change, <laughs> but I don't like where I am. And so some of it is getting them to look internally and not just at the business. Once, once, once we've got a clear understanding of what the owner, the CEO's personal outcomes are, right? Then we can say, okay, great. What in the business is holding you back? So, for example, I, you know, had a, we had a client that um, when we got into this, and first of all, he didn't really buy into like a lot of this life coaching bullshit stuff, mm-hmm. right? It was, yeah. Um, but when we pressed, it was well. What I really want is I want to take a month's vacation without any business calls. He bought a cabin up in Michigan about 10 years ago and had never been able to do that. Okay. Okay, great. I, so I what, respect that. Yeah. I respect that. That's so like what's holding like, you yeah. back. So yeah, so what's holding you back? Right. And it, so it comes out that a big issue was his leadership team. They did not have the alignment, the capability, um, or the accountability for him to be able to take a, a full month off. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Let's dig in there. Let's dig in and understand. 
what we can do to improve the leadership team. And some of it had to do with attitude. Some of it had to do with expectations. Some of it had to do with talent, you know, just the experiences and the skill sets that they had. But mm -hmm. that's something that we can go attack. Mm -hmm. That's something we can go fix. Right. And of course, as we got into that, other things cascaded out of that. Right. Um, you know, they didn't necessarily have a business outcome. They were just muddling along. They did not have measures that I, I always view the, the outcome where you want to be. And then those KPIs that you have, those key performance indicators kind of create right. an internal company GPS it tells me where I am. And it tells me where I am relative to where I want to go. And it tells me if I'm getting there or not. Mm -hmm. right? So we want to create those. So it kind of cascaded down and then that got into the other, but we completely changed the culture of the company into one that was much more aligned, much more accountable and much more focused on actual business outcomes than it was before. And in fact, you know, he wanted to have this four month or four week vacation three years from now. He got it in 18 months. Score. Yeah, exactly. Everybody wins, right? He wins, his company wins, his employee wins. You know, one of the things that I firmly believe is that, you know, when you think about your employees, when you think about the people on your team, they're really only a couple things that they want, right? And one of them is to feel like they're a part of something better than, but not better, bigger than themselves, right? Right. But they also need to know how they fit into that very, 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 very clearly. And if you're not providing that feedback and people, you know, always think about feedback, feedback isn't good or bad. It just is. It's not mm -hmm. negative. It just mm -hmm. is. Right. But people want a target to hit. People want to win at whatever game they're playing. And part of the responsibility of company leadership is is to provide that. Mm -hmm. Right. Tell me, you know, make me part of your team. Give me a position. Tell me what the score is. Tell me how we win. Right. Yeah. And I think that's that's huge. And most most companies, especially small, you know, they grow organically. They bring people in. They walk past that. They don't think about that. It's not because they're stupid. It's just, again, it's just experience and skill set. But I find mm -hmm. a lot of companies don't have that alignment, that encouragement, you know, that that definition for the folks on the team and once once people have that and if you treat them as if they're special and when i say special i don't mean you know give them opportunities someone else might not have or something like that but give them you know treat them as an individual as somebody unique and valued just because they're there mm -hmm. right you put those two things in place and organizations can just rocket yeah that's exciting you line them up the people want to do a good job right they, they want do. nobody they wakes want up in the do. morning and says i want oh you know what today i'm going to be mediocre nobody does that <laughs> nobody they may wake that. up and feel browbeat around i can't do a good job because of all of this stuff but nobody yeah. wants to do a bad job everybody wants to do good yeah i remember um back when i was in manufacturing early on we were it was um Deming was a big name. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know the name. And um, his his whole thing was that management, a problem in a business is, you know, because of man management decisions. It's like 99% yeah. on their shoulders because they have all the control. So, And I think that that's still true. I think that, you know, that's that's something that is blindingly obvious now maybe but at the time and he said it wasn't yeah and no it wasn't it was a different time and now a lot so of much technology ar around the process that it's it, we get a lot of feedback now mm -hmm. and it's instant so it's it's the not a not just a challenge of making something of you know creating a process that's repeatable and predictable but it's also 
having the right software and creating a competitive advantage, listening to your to your customer and then being able to move quickly to fix, adjust, improve, right? Listening to your customer and being able to break down what their needs are into something into elements that you can deliver to them, making sure that that's well defined for the folks that work for you on your team, and then, you know, as as he said, get kind of get out of the way. Yeah. Or you know, manager's job is really to remove the barriers of workers doing their best work possible. Right. It's not to tell them what to do. It's to empower them and enable them. Right. Yeah. Make, make their job easier, get stuff out of their way so they can get what you want them to do done. Mm -hmm. And they're not f fixing fighting fires. Exactly. Oh man. Fighting fires. I was, I was a professional firefighter when I was a manufacturing engineer and, mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was all about every day. And my, my entire focus was to get my job set up so that I wasn't, I was ahead of that wave of crap. Yep. Yep. And then that, that pulled me into, you know, advanced manufacturing engineering where I was introducing new products into the production line. And, and so that was fun. So I was able to take what I learned about fighting fires and incorporate that into the new process. And we had less fires. Exactly. But most 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 places didn't do that, right? And I was at a, um, you know, they they continued to reward the firefighters and they built in all of the problems into the next set of products and the next set of because you know, like it's it's like I don't know who discovered water, but I know it wasn't a fish. If you live in an environment, if you're working in an environment where fires are a regular common occurrence. Uh -huh. it, it takes becomes normal. special to kind of go, wait a second, this isn't the way we should be doing things. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then we incorporated uh, some of the Japanese methods, uh, Kanban and Pokyoki and um, mm -hmm. uh, statistical process controls and all that stuff. And, and then, then in just in time where we bring stuff out and we were reducing the inventory. So we'd stop the line. If there wasn't a part, we'd just stop the line. And it was like, oh. Whoa, everybody was really nervous. Well, because because the whole reward system changes, right? Yeah. Everything. I was in a manufacturing plant when we started implementing, you know, a lot of the Deming thinking that the what they called total quality yeah, back in right. the 80s, right? The yeah. 70s and 80s that kind of right. evolved. Um, and we had the whole reward structure was set up not to capture the errors, but to fix them, to band-aid them. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're right. So, and you know, we'd have this huge surge table behind a, behind a, a capper, right? Because, well, what happens in case, you know, the capper goes down? We don't, right. we don't want to, well, no, the right answer is let the damn thing go down and then continue to, you know, fix it so that it doesn't break again. Right. Just in time versus just in case. We were, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Just in case. Yeah. We, I remember a, all that that was those were fun times because we actually when we implemented that everybody's looking at us like what are you guys doing and then then the company at that time they had i think 53 manufacturing facilities around the country and they decided to consolidate those and they 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 used us as one of the three that were left after they consolidated so we onboarded all this manufacturing from all those other facilities and one of the it had the capacity to do it. Yeah. Because we had our act together. We had we could pr process that stuff and make quality product, get it out on time and make money with it. Mm -hmm. And nobody else could seem to figure that out. No, I was I used to work for for Procter and Gamble and one of the big rallying cries in the in the 80s and the 90s was getting to 85% operating efficiencies, right? Mm -hmm. And the time we started those, most of the plants were operating at 40, 50%. And this, so we needed a whole bunch of plants. But as the plants, you know, we were able to consolidate. You know, we, we, I was part of several different North American sourcing studies looking at, you know, what plants we should be then Cons you know, where we should be consolidating yeah. because you're right. You can just get a better use of capital and it makes total sense for a business. 
right? Well, what's fascinating is what I find with a lot of clients, even you know, medium-sized companies. I just finished uh, an engagement with a company that is a global leader in chemical distribution, and they still their their work processes, their thinking are still back in the '70s. They have not incorporated a lot of the the daily management or the quality management, the Lean Six Sigma, you know, debottlenecking kinds of ideas. Yeah. There's a, still survive, a lot right? of work to be done. Yeah. Well, if they're still making money, I guess that's okay. Yeah. They just could be making so much more. They could be making so much and, more. And sure. people's, people's lives, the, the employees' lives could be so much better. Yeah. Because again, yeah, never, like you said, nobody wants to be mediocre and everybody recognizes when, when yeah. the job is mediocre. Well, I remember when I was um, we had a, I was with a company that was based in Indianapolis, and um, we were manufacturing different parts for uh, an application applications for noise vibration and shock control, technical stuff. And the company when I started with them, they were about thirty years old, and they were you know they were doing okay, just kind of ten to twelve million dollars, nice little business, bouncing around. Mm -hmm. um, from time, a couple times in their history, they'd gotten up to 18 million and then immediately went back to 10, 12. And um, it was, it was tough sometimes because they'd have to, you know, there were periods of time that they were rationing pencils and, and, you know, office supplies and, oh my God. And, and then um, when we changed our business model and started going after major accounts, uh, I landed Apple computer and we parlayed that into business with Hewlett Packard and Microsoft and other companies and grew the business from 10 to over 43 million and grew the, the um, profitability. The gross profit went from about 15% average up to 55%. Wow. And life changed. It was so much more fun. Yes. We had, we had, everything we needed i know the tools and we hired great people and and it was like so much more fun you know you know that that bootstrapping for for smaller companies or that you know kind of trying to get through that knot hole for growing companies can mm -hmm. be really stressful but yeah when you're on the other side of it you know if if you if you do the if you do it right and don't just continue to grow with all your problems it can really hit a sweet spot for a company and really propel them, propel them forward. And you're right. Yeah. It's a lot more fun to work there. Yeah. And then we ended up being acquired by a uh, 3M corporation and our valuation was like four hundred and forty, hundred twenty-three 123 million. Wow. So that was, that was a nice bump. Yeah. No kidding. So, so I just curious, looking at your bio, you say you talk about the dance of leadership. Yes. And I wanted to explore that with you. What is that? So I think it's kind of on two different dimensions. So when I think about the dance of leadership, a real leader, I think they have to recognize. So first of all, you know, you're not a leader if you turn around and no one's behind you. Right. right? Your job as a leader is to have that vision, provide that tension between what is and what could be mm -hmm. and make that could be so appealing that people want to follow you to where you're where you're taking them so it's creating that tension right and that tension is a little bit of a dance okay right? you can't get too far ahead so that they so that they can't conceive of what you're talking about mm -hmm. but you can't let off on the gas either and and have them bump into you so they got to be following you but not too close Right. Got it. And so yeah. it's it's not a leader isn't somebody in my mind who just goes out and marches straight ahead. Right. You're turning back around. You're having to commute. You're having to talk. You're having to continue. One of the things that I learned um, from a leadership standpoint is the is how important communication is. I used mm -hmm. to get, you know, before it really drilled into my head, I said, why am I repeating myself? We've already talked about this. Right. Why? Why do I have to keep talking about? It? Well, you do because people have a whole lot of other things on their minds and you need to keep their attention. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to keep their attention. Right. 
I, th I think the, the other dance is between leadership and management, right? And there, and there are two different kinds of dances there. But, you know, people tend to conflate the two mm -hmm. and, and they're really different. So if I use the, you know, if, if, if I, if we continue with the, with the metaphor of just, you know, the leader creating that tension and, and, and setting that vision the management is really there to provide the support for all the people that are following. Right. So there's a dance also between management and leader. And in, in a lot of smaller companies, um, you've got to wear both hats. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to wear both hats, you have to be very deliberate from a from a, a self a self understanding or self knowledge standpoint, you have to be very aware. Aware is a better word than deliberate. Be very aware of when you're the leader and when you're the manager, because their functions are completely different, and you're relating to people on a completely different level. How so, does personal authenticity play into that? I think I think it's I think it's huge, right? I think you know. Um, you have to be real with people, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we, I don't know if we're, we're programmed or what to spot a phony, right? But personal authenticity is very important when, regardless of whether you're a leader or a manager, people have to see you as someone like themselves. If you're, if you project yourself as some kind of super person, mm -hmm right then i can't relate first of all i don't want it because i get a kind of there's kind of a bad vibe right but second of all i can't relate i you know it's 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 like having superman as your role model right mm -hmm. well that's kind of cool except i can't do anything he does he's, he's not my role model right but if right. it's if it's a, another human being i can do that too right i can i can i can achieve what they're achieving i can help with achieving that it's not out of the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the challenge is with personal authenticity is still, whether you're a leader or a manager, is still being on your best game. You know, there's, there's too often, I see too often people, well, that's just the way I am. Yeah, but it's not working. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a positive leadership attribute. It's not a positive management skill right mm -hmm. so if you're going to be a leader or a manager you know it, it's 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 almost trite but you know the whole thing starts and starts with you it starts in your head you have to self you have to be you have to lead yourself first before you can be a real leader of anybody else you have to manage yourself first before you can manage other people because that's another way of if i if i don't do that that's another way of, of being phony and people can, people can pick up on that and you're just yeah. not going to be as, as good. So yes, personal authenticity is best is, is, is very important, but you've got to be able to not just project, but actualize the best parts of yourself when you're doing it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it absolutely does. It's but sometimes I would imagine like I remember my days in I spent years inside in as a manufacturing engineer, you know, working at a factory, right? And and also spent many years outside in outside sales. And you're part of a team, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a culture and there's a there's certain norms involved with the the, the you know the corporate style and you got to fit in and and they're looking for you to be independent but also tethered yes like you said you're part of a team right? yeah so but i i and i remember having th thoughts about wow i need to grow into this th this position i i'm i'm I, there's something lacking and i didn't really understand what it was or I didn't understand how to fix it. And there was really no hope for me to, you know, it's like, okay, well, go read a book, <laughs> you know? Right, 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 right. Well, well, well what? okay, but there's thousands, millions of books out there to read. What? And I love to read and I'm always trying to improve and better myself. 
but how do you figure out where to go and what to do to to actually get better and grow like that mm -hmm. and i think that's that's where that's where coaching can be such a do you address those kind of things in your with your programs yeah when i have to absolutely absolutely we'll have those conversations and you know if you think about it and, and there are lots of different ways of getting coaching i mean you could pay for coaching you could have a mentor mm -hmm. right um you know a it could be inside your company it could be outside your company but some yeah, places one now. Have those conversations right yeah i mean because I've... no go ahead, go ahead. no because you're right. And, you know, reading books, you still need to have a conversation with somebody to distill that knowledge. And then should you decide to say, yeah, that's the way I want to be. You still need that GPS, right? You've established that outcome. I want to be like this. Yeah. But you still need a GPS that's objective that's saying, yeah, you're making progress or, you know, you need to turn a little bit left. You need to go a little bit right. You need to go a little bit faster to to get to that yeah because that, that d d example you gave where somebody like basically they shut down they they you know they put their hands across like this and they, they say you know no to me that's a defensive move and that to me tells me you know at face value that person isn't up to the job i think that's right i think that's right i think any i think a core attribute of real leaders is learning and pushing themselves. Again, it comes back to that self-leadership piece. Mm -hmm. if I'm not good enough today. I want to be better. I want to be here and I haven't gotten there. And once right. I get there, then I set new goals. Right. right. Yeah. There's this always there's Bob Donnell is my coach and he's, he's always saying well, with every next level, there's, there's more stuff to work on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, and you got, always got to keep working at that. It never stops. Mm -hmm. It's it's a variation of that whole idea of like the fixed mindset versus the the open mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's it's a very defensive thing of well, that's just the way I am. People have to learn to deal. It's like well, it's like how badly do you want change? Yeah, right. Well, it's I want to get a, I want to get a double my valuation on my company but I'm not willing to change. Yeah. So that's the CEO yeah. saying that <laughs> it's like, Ooh. Yeah. If they say that it's kind of like, okay, so what you're telling me, let's say the company's worth, you know, 20 million right now and you want to get 40 million for it before you retire. So what you're telling me is it's worth $20 million to you to not change. Right. Yeah. Right. I, and I would go so far as to say, that it's 20 million now, but with that attitude, it's going to be 10 million quickly. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. This, so, okay. and, and that's why, and that's again, one of the reasons why I, I work best. I like working best with, with companies that really are looking to grow, looking to expand that they've, mm -hmm. that they've mm -hmm. got that open, flexible mindset of maybe we do have to do things differently. They may not know what they are. Right. Right but they know they're something they're isn't working as well as they could. They're groping in the dark a little bit. And so First we come in and shine in. a light on it. That's, you know, shine a light with, you know, get them clear on their outcomes, get them clear on what the measures are, get, make sure that they've got the cultural attributes that drive alignment and engagement. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, in fact, if you think about it, that would be the triangle or the tripod to really build something magnificent. If you, if you pay attention to those three things. Yeah. What were the three things again? Um, let's see if I can do this. Um, <laughs> Put you on the spot. The first, the first is 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 having a really tangible goal or outcome. What do right. you want to make happen in the next period of time? Secondly, how do you keep score? If you think about this as a game, and when I say game, it's a very serious game. It's not, you know, I'm not belittling the concept at all, but mm -hmm. it's a game. So. What's the game we're playing? How, you know, what does winning look like? How do we keep score, right? What are those measures, those metrics, those KPIs that I use for my organ for the business and for my organization? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what do I need to do? How do I put in place those 
cultural principles that drive engagement with my team and mm -hmm. alignment with my team. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And if somebody, if somebody woke up tomorrow and went in to their company and thought about those three things in a different way, I guarantee that they would see different results. Because again, most people don't. Most most companies don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's opportunities um, out there, right? Yeah. It's just a matter of being open to to change and and creating that tension. It's like the the gap, like you're saying, between the outcome and mm -hmm. the current state, and figuring out, okay, well, we want this now. How do we get there? Yeah. Yeah. And if and if you take a stumble, it's that's part of the learning process. We just let's not let's not do that again. Yeah, right. right, right. Yeah, the learning. Yeah. I think it was somebody said that what is it? Thomas Jefferson, not Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Edison um, tried over 3000 different filaments for a light bulb before he yeah. finally found one that worked. Yeah. You know, and it's like he didn't fail. He just didn't succeed 3000 times. Yeah. But I'll also bet you that he didn't use try using the same filament over and over again. And it not working. You're probably right. Yeah. Yep. I have one more question. This time goes by so quick. It does. Um, you got I've time for one more? Thing. Absolutely. Great. It's it's. I ask this of everybody on the show. Is basically taking a look at your whole life. What was the boldest leadership decision that you've made, and what were the consequences? When I worked, when I was the vice president for St. Bernard Soap Company, which is a contract manufacturing company, it was actually a conversion from um, a Procter & Gamble facility to a private equity facility. So we had to really change the mindset of about 350 employees from okay. being just a cost center that, P, you know, Mama P&G will take care of us to really running a company that needed to be focused. And we had a union. We were in the middle of union negotiations. Mm. And... Um, their their expectations were locked in the old Procter and Gamble model. We couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford the the benefits increases, the salary increases they were looking for. Um, and so I want I want to say it was on a whim, but it was very much a very very quick decision. I decided to kind of go rogue and share the company P and L with the union to step up, trust them, but go open book with them. Okay. So that they understood really that what was the bold. situation was with the company. Definitely um, a bold move. What happened with that? Um, in fact, it got to the point we started reviewing this every, every month with the union. And mm -hmm. eventually they would come and give us better ideas for how we could cut costs or improve productivity than a group of managers sitting in a room by themselves could think of. So it, it completely changed the strategic relationship. Now we still had our issues with work rules and can't do this and you can't do that. And why'd you change that shift, et cetera. But at the, at the top level, I think it really, it really changed the way we worked with each other and made it much more of a team effort. And again, it's, it's, it's it's going back. It's it's providing people. We provided them with the knowledge that they needed to be able to get on board. Right? We could have we could have not done that, and we could have just continued to do this. Had a really mm -hmm. bad relationship. But I think demonstrating that trust, providing them with that information, um, really changed the relationship we had with with our workforce. How much money are we talking about in this company? What was the? We had, we were about a we were about a quarter of a billion dollar company in 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 sales. Okay, that was definitely a bold move. Yeah. So and you know as as far as I know they they kept it confidential like we asked them to. Okay. There's a lot of trust involved in that. It was a really it was a step into the abyss a little bit, but Very it good. worked. It worked, and you know. I'd do it again in a heartbeat, right? 
because it was the right thing to do for the folks. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Our our time's about up, but. uh, No, thanks very much. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And uh, yeah, great stories. Your, your bold, boldest experience. Fantastic. I love that. So thank you for sharing that. It's great. Yeah. And um, and so we'll sign off. We'll sign off. I hope hope to visit Temecula sometime and try some of the single malt they've got. Look me up. Yeah. We'll do that. Definitely. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much. We'll see you.